next panel discussion titled The Practice and Challenges of Digital Democracy, How Digital Authoritarianism is Spread Through False Information and Affects Democracy. I would like to now invite our moderator and panelists to join us on stage. There are five panelists in this session, respectively, from the USA, Israel, uh, and Estonia, Canada, and Taiwan. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them a big round of applause as we welcome them on, to join us on stage. Welcome. And Lithuania, welcome. And our moderator for this session is Mr. Yeo Zhihao, co-director of Taiwan Information Environment Research Center. Please take a seat. Welcome. Thank you. I turn the floor over to Mr. Yeo. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, how are you today? Um, welcome to panel three. Um, we're talking about disinformation and digital authoritarianism in the final panel of this forum. Uh, my name is Zhi Hao. I work at Taiwan Information Environment Research Center, or better known as IORG internationally. Um, we are a scientific research organization and uh, we run also digital civics educational programs for schools and communities across Taiwan uh, with the goal of informing public discourse and strengthening democratic resilience. Um, today, uh, during lunch, I hope you heard the keynote speech by Prime Minister Hager. Uh, he brilliantly uh, prefaced our discussion with the threat of authoritarian and disinformation against democracies around the world. Um, in IORG, our research suggests that authoritarian information manipulation, uh, in this case from China, is trying to present an alternative worldview for democ democracies around the world. Um, and today I'm very glad and very honored to be monitoring this panel of experienced experts across the world and uh, in congregation in this uh, panel to talk about the threat and how we're dealing with those threats. Um, okay, so let me introduce our panelists, and we'll, each of them will get 10 minutes of their statements. Um, and then we'll proceed to Q&A uh, with you. Um, all right, first we have Mr. Uh, Giedrimas Yang-Linkskas. Um, he's the former Assistant uh, Secretary General, NATO. Um, uh, please give a warm welcome to our panel. And then we have Mr. Yigal Una, uh, former Director General, National Cyber Directorate, Israel. Please welcome. <laughs> then we have Honorable Kale Lane, um, Member of Parliament, Estonia. Welcome. <laughs> um, then we have Ms. Jennifer Irish, Director, Information Integ Integrity Lab, University of Ottawa, Canada. Welcome. And finally, we have Dr. Ren Fu Wang, uh, Assistant Professor at the Department of Information Management, Yuanzhi University, Republic of China, Taiwan, also one of the directors of Hackers in Taiwan, HITCOM. Welcome. Okay. Um, thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, let's begin with our first panelist, uh, Giedrimas. The floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for your kind introduction, and really, thank you, thank you, Chairman Chen and the Foundation and, and uh, great people of Taiwan for f of having, having us here. What a great conference, what a great opportunity to, to meet with friends, to discuss, to understand, to continue deepen our understanding of each other. So really, really appreciate the, this opportunity to be here on stage. Uh, now, uh, my kind of spiel, uh, if, you, if you will, uh, is kind of try to look at it first uh, broadly on the whole environment and I think and then maybe go into some policy insights which I think are important to discuss in, in every setting just so we kind of come out with something sort of to-do list uh, hopefully uh, in, in, in the, for, the, for the future. Now in terms of um, 
broader backdrop that what's happening, I think we've heard from, from probably from the first presentation from President Lai, uh, who, uh, who opened the, this, uh, this conference to Ambassador Haley, you know, where, you know, we all kind of agree, we're all preaching to the choir here, we all understand the world we're, we're living in. Um, freedom is challenged, it's challenged around the world. Anxious, aggressive, autocratic regimes are trying to undermine our way of life, the, our international rules-based order. It's, it's a trend that's been happening for, for, we know, for at least several years, but we are where we are, and the real geopolitical competition through sort of great power ri uh, rivalry, but then also really the, the sort of blo uh, the block rivalry of sort of democracy of autocracies is, is a real thing. So I think if we, if we look at that, it's, uh, I think, we, we can all agree on that. I think this is, this is the, the reality that we live in. Now, underlying all of that, and I think this is where it's very important that we're all, we've been really elaborately and diligently uh, sort of uh, calling democracy is, is really the, the way of light that we want to live is in democracies. And I think whoever, Churchill or somebody else said that there's, there's only one, you know, there's, there's many different forms of government. There's only one that's really uh, um, the one that works is, is, is democracy. There's no, better, there's no other better alternative to democracy. Now, underlying that is uh, a statement that I used and uh, I tried to use it very, in a simple way, not, not to overbear with facts, but really because having run the presidential campaign just several months ago in Lithuania, I know that people want simplicity. <laughs> people want real, real catchy phrases. To me, it's all about that people want to be free. People want to be free. And people are fighting for that. People in Israel are trying to defend their, their way of life. A democracy, the only democracy in the, in the Middle East, our key, key ally. People in Ukraine are dying for, for freedom because that's an existential threat is to their livelihoods, to their lives, to their existence as a, as a nation, as a people. So I think we're, we're in this moment that we have to realize that, yes, it's, it's, if we're threatened, we will defend, we will, you know, People will die if, if, if required, but we don't, of course we want to avoid it. That's what, and that's what Ambassador Haley has been talking very clearly. We need to build that defense capability so that defense leads to deterrence. But that's, again, that's, we're talking about real sort of kinetic war terms. Now this panel is about also the digital domain, right? And I think in a digital domain, although we're in a kind of broadly speaking a new cold war, which, is, which hopefully will remain cold, but in the digital domain, we are already at war. We're in cyberspace or misinformation, disinformation, pure lies being spread through various sort of media channels. Um, there are a, a lot of challenges in the digital domain, and I think this sort of war in the digital domain is, we, we can't run away, we can't escape it, we have to somehow deal with it. That's why I think it's very, very important that, and it's great that you have, that the conference organizers have this kind of panel for kind of larger discussions around Indo-Pacific security. Now, to me, I'll have, um, and really quickly, I know the time's limited, and I, I love, to, as a former military guy, I love to stick to the time, that I don't want to ex exceed my time. Um, that first, I have like probably seven short insights or directions that I think are important to consider, that, that I sort of bring from my NATO experience, from my Lithuania uh, Ministry of Defense experience. And so first is we have to guard the truth. And I know it's so hard. In a post-truth world where we're all kind of stick to our beliefs and we wanna, we're unwilling to change our beliefs, even in, this, in the face of facts, that's a very human, by the way, thing to do, but I think just nowadays it's specifically volatile in a way that whatever, you know, people just uh, don't believe. They give them the facts, they'll say, no, I don't believe the facts. So it's, it's a very difficult journey to, but guarding the truth is absolutely incredibly important. And it will only get harder as the new technologies come, come to the fore. If we see, you know, AI, and I think we'll mention probably AI many times in this panel, you know, whatever the impact, it's, it's going to be huge. And fighting that, guarding that truth is absolutely important. And of course, our adversaries are very adept and utilizing our weak, sort of weaknesses that we think as strengths, they see them as our rules-based order as a weakness and they, they try to, to use it against us. Second thing, is uh, really regulation of media. 
And I think we've seen, you know, when I was sort of in my late 20s, all the social, Facebook and other things sort of came up, and it was all exciting, we all get connected, what a great thing social media is. Now I think with time we realize that this whole social media, when unregulated, can actually cause a lot of harm. It causes certain, you know, certain challenges to our social fabric, weaken our social fabric, really create really havoc in societies, which then is, you know goes beyond anything comprehensible. And again, I'm going to mention AI here again. It would AI really supercharging, turbocharging that that so that those media outlets, it's it can be really hard to to catch them if 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 we let them without regulation. Of course, that regulation has to not stifle the innovation, but again, that's for policymakers to come up with, but it's important to consider that. Third, we have to correct the false narrative. Now, when the German, so whatever, when, when the lies are being spread, we somebody has to do it. Somebody, and I think within, that's where the power of the nation state is, that they have, you have to have agencies or some sort of overarching structure within the government's an institution that is able to kind of fight and, and regulate these, these sort of spread of misinformation. In Lithuania, when German Brigade arrived in 2017 uh, as a NATO enhanced forward presence to, um, to, to sort of be, be part of that deterrence efforts in Lithuania, the first misinformation accident, accident incident was that it was a, a falsely spread rumor that a German soldier raped a Lithuanian girl. It was completely untrue, it was completely nonsense, but it was caught very fast, and we kind of used that example many, many times already, that, look, it's about catching it and correcting the narrative. Now, that's a very small, isolated case, but I think if we look at the broader setting, if you're attacked from big company, company, uh, country like China or Russia, these attacks can be multiple. So it's really about having a strong institution in the government that's able to control, it's able to, to respond. Uh, fourth, work together. Very obvious. We know Russia, you know China better. We know, we meaning probably Eastern and Central Europeans know Russia better than anybody else. I, I, I would argue, I think Taiwan knows China better than anybody else. It's about exchanging notes and understanding how these, how w the way to, to fight um, this, and this information. Fifth, educate population. Again, that goes beyond anything that we talk here in this room. It's really about the whole of government approach that the, this, the Minister of Education is part of that, <laughs> of these exercises, understands of where direction and education needs to go, that we, we educate the, the young in such a way that they're able to distinguish these, these threats, distinguish the, the lies, and be able to kind of be a resilient society, become a resilient, truly resilient society that we, we seek to be. Six, it's a race. I think we have to acknowledge that, and th that means that we need to continue to invest in our in, our, in the technology and those te in, in policy, in technologies that, that in certain priorities that really when we, we think we're safe now from a certain disinformation attacks, you know that adversaries will continue to you know, innovate, invest. We need to continuously get better at, at these investments. Seventh, who's in charge? The question is, you know, somebody has to have, if everybody's in charge, nobody's in charge, we know that. So you have to have a, a key person, whether for a kind of res resiliency of a society and or disinformation, inc including cyber. So it has to be, in my opinion, it's like a role of a prime minister in normal, in many countries, could be a deputy prime minister, but somebody who has overarching responsibility and is being listened to in all the ministries. That's again, something very operational that to do. So again, the whole goal is to preserve democracy and live pros prosperously. So I think we're all capable of doing that. But these are my, my initial thoughts. So I'll stop here. Thank you, sir, for keeping to the time. Um, to save time, um, we'll move to the next panelist, uh, Igor, for your remarks. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for having me here. Uh, my first time in uh, Taiwan also, and I believe I'm the only Israeli representative on stage today, so it's an even greater honor. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Igor Luna, and I'm 36 years in this October, coming October, 36 years in the business, which is now called cybersecurity. I prefer to call it uh, digital security because it's much wider. And as you can do the math, I started like uh, the age of 17 or something in the, in the military when it was the late 80s. And I witnessed in my uh, career, mostly in the public service, 33 years out of the 36, 
uh, two major evolutions go in uh, hand by hand. First is, of course, technology. I started my service with a facsimile, which is still in service, by the way. You'll find it here and there, even in militaries around the world. But it's, while it's still here, we see the first generation, second, 5G. They're all here. It's aggregated. Nothing is removed. Even the telex, I was told, is still in use. AI is the new thing. And there will be another new things. What I'm saying is every brilliant new invention in the ICT, information communication technology, is what we consider a, a new attack surface, a new threat. And unfortunately, we see that piling up. I mentioned two vectors. The other vector is the dark side, the abuse of this ICT. And let's say 15 years ago, it's, uh, uh, it's funny to, to say traditional about something that is old as 15 years, only 15 years, but uh, the traditional cyber started with uh, uh, innocent, so to speak, uh, espionage, just hacking to copy, not even to steal the information, but to copy it. We keep it there, but we copy it to another place. The second phase of the evolution was, okay, if we're in, let's do some damage, destruction. Then we came, of course, to the financial aspects. Ransomware is a, a conditioned uh, destruction of, of information. If you don't pay, you will not have the data. If you pay, we'll release it back to you. And the last and the most disturbing, and the, the reason we're here, is the influence. Influence campaigns or influence what is, the, the, the headline is uh, author, authoritarianism. It's hard to say, I, I prefer to, to call it digital bullying because that's much more accurate to my, to my uh, point of view to describe this uh, phenomena. It's not just stealing or copying the ideas, which is bad by itself. It's not wiping out, which is also bad. It's even worse because it's manipulating the, 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 the most intimate and most individual things that we have, our mind and mindset, as individuals, as societies, as people. And this phase, unfortunately, we see it spread more and more. And uh, it's not a new thing. Two examples to show how it's not new. It's 2013, uh, like 11 years ago. I'm a dinosaur, so I remember everything. 2013, April, you don't remember, but Barack Obama was the president. And suddenly, in the middle of the day, a breaking news in Associated Press uh, 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 Twitter account, then it was still called Twitter, saying explosions in the White House, uh, Barack Obama is injured, or something like that. All the news media outlets all going to Pennsylvania 1600, and, uh, of course, the stock exchange drops like in two-digit billion dollars. Now, it took seven minutes exactly for Associated Press to realize somebody hacked to their Twitter account. He wasn't smart enough. Hacking 101, don't quote me, but once you hack, you change the password and then it belongs to you, but okay. And he didn't do that, lucky, and no, nothing happened in the White House, so it returned back to almost the original level of, of uh, trade. The amazing thing, it was done by uh, the Syrian Electronic Army for mediocre, and I'm really generous in giving mediocre uh, title to them, uh, hackers from the uh, Syrian uh, Assad regime's squad. They, the, the GDP of Syria is like one-fifth of the GDP of uh, Wisconsin state. It's not a match financially, not a match militarily, not a match technology, but they manage to find the, the right spot, understanding the mindset of their victims and to hit, and it could cause, if they're a little more sophisticated, a, a huge catastrophic damage, financially trust in the system. And then we go just three years later to uh, the DNC. Now we have the DNC in Chicago. Back then, 2016, the DNC uh, with a big scandal 
of the, the Senator Schultz emails with, uh, with the Hillary Clinton, and we know what happened next. I was in a, a, a guest of the FBI uh, back then in the US, and I told them, You're, are you sure it's, it's, a, it's a, an incident? Back then they already knew it's something that organized, orchestrated by, by the Russians, and then they, they have even uh, indictments. But after that, uh, two years later, I was appointed as, as Director General of the Israel Directorate, and I have a Guinness Book of Record of defending elections. Four elections in two years. I survived that, barely. And in each election, we saw a growing volume and quality of uh, attempts and attacks. Some of them came from just here in the neighborhood, we spoke of all the day long, uh, and each time they try to improve. And that makes me understand that, first of all, yes, it's all about, first of all, undermining people's trust. And the problem is getting too easy in our open, liberal, democratic societies to undermine people's trust as we consume more and more of our knowledge, of our view on life through digital, digital media. I'm probably the only guy in my neighborhood in Tel Aviv that still gets a newspaper printed. My kids say, stop, you're, you're embarrassing us. Do like all the other dads, by digital. Yes, we also by digital. And yes, it's too easy to manipulate. And that brought Israel to the conclusion that the most critical infrastructure, and I re recommend to, to, to adopt it, is democracy. Yes, we have electricity, we have watering, we have all the usual suspects. But democracy is by far, first of all, the most critical to defend, and second, the hardest. With the turbine that generates electricity, I know where the perimeter, I know where it starts, where it ends. It's an engineering problem, almost. The same goes with, uh, with banking and financial systems, but with democracy. Where exactly is the uh, democracy system that we need to defend? And in critical, it means zero incidents, zero breaches. And that brought Israel to the state of mind that now my successor took the responsibility, as my colleague here very rightfully mentioned, you need a one. If there's two, there's none. One leader, one key agency reporting, we report to, directly to the prime minister, to the highest instance, responsible for all aspects of digital bullying, including uh, the uh, softer one, but softer and very, uh, very bad as they are. Now, we need to remember, we are used to millions of years that people are, are unfortunately killing other people and hurting other people. But we are used to this equation that using small weapons, you can cause small damage. Air or sword can do kill one or two. In order to do a massive destruction like nuclear, very few countries, and as you well know, Israel is working very hard to make sure it's still very few countries, have the, the, the capabilities. And then came cyber and digital warfare. And that changed all the game rules entirely because with a keyboard and the internet access, you can cause 10 times more damage than Hiroshima by melting down nuclear power plants, and if we talk about mindsets, even worse. You can poison societies, kids, generations for decades, like nuclear uh, uh, destruction. So, what we should do as the time runs out? First of all, awareness and preparedness, yes, that's a basic, but don't rely only on that because it has a limited effectiveness. Partnerships, for sure. This is one of the reasons I'm here, yes. Partnership is the key for any success, key factor to any, any uh, uh, success in, in counter-bullying. But also go proactive. Don't just talk about norms and regulations. It never works. I, we heard the, the former ambassador to the UN. UN, yes, you have the GGE and other working groups. It will never go away. By the way, one of them is led by uh, Russia. 
good luck for that. And go proactive. Proactive means, yes, you should put the gloves or remove the gloves, remove, pull up the sleeves, and work like bullies should be dealt with, mm. with aggression, with pointing out, and I'll finish with example, just uh, two years ago, three years ago exactly, in uh, Tehran, a Vin prison, the notorious prison that holds uh, uh, political prisoners and journalists, and uh, uh, one day, someone, uh, probably Iranian opposition group, hacked into the uh, control room and removed all the screens with the free run and run for Iranians, immediately followed by a massive leakage of videos taken months earlier from the uh, internal cameras showing out to the world, mostly to the Iranians, what are the you know, atrocities are done inside the prison. Although Iran is authoritarian regime and, and uh, non-democratic, still people there have minds. And what they were witnessing uh, because of this cyber attack, what happens in their own prison, an outrage broke out and the, the uh, protest began. And the regime need to apologize and to, to re make reforms and do things. So yes, I recommend go proactive. Don't wait for the storm to come make it the first move. And last, the Israeli industry, yes, make some benefit from our misfortune. We are one of the most targeted countries in the world, kinetic, kibernetic. We need evolutionary, we need to develop a strong industry to defend ourselves. Take advantage of that and use the Israeli technology, it's at your disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you much, sir. <laughs> And let's move on to our next panelist, uh, Kali. The floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, it's a great privilege to be here. My common road with Taiwan started in uh, 2012. Of course, we go up and down, and, and uh, very often I'm receiving different messages from the uh, Chinese embassy. Uh, of course, they are not uh, positive messages, but uh, I don't care about that. Previous speakers spoke all the things what I would like to bring to you, but, uh, but uh, I tried to, to give some extra points. Edward and Artis explained very well our attitude uh, in our side of the world, also Gary Minas. But um, if I am uh, talking a little story about the past, it was the middle of the 80s. Soviet regime started to melt already in Estonia. A young boy coming to home from kindergarten. And Tina is starting. And he is saying so loudly, thank you, Uncle Lenin, for the food. Family was shocked. Why my son is saying these words? These words were said every single lunchtime by teacher in kindergarten. What I would like, to, would like to say, propaganda started from kindergarten. What has changed right now in society? Like you said, internet came. It's, it's more easy to spread all this, this information, no borders, massive information, this information can be delivered to the thousands or millions just with a one click. Totally different situation what was in the past, but authoritarian regimes are using this situation now more and more. If we are taking the next uh, example, it was 2021, when Russian army started the biggest exercise in Russia. They moved military phase to the borders of Ukraine. Exercise finished. Techniques stayed. 
And what kind of information they gave to the public? It's just exercise. Nothing will happen. What was the next uh, step? Hybrid attacks against Polish border, Lithuanian border, and also Latvian border. What Putin did? Putin checked unity of Europe. He can't destroy that. Of course, he said that, oh, it's not, not my fault that the hybrid attack started against the borders. Different messages again, different messages again. When we see what's happened at the end of 2021, we had intelligence information that uh, Russia will attack Ukraine. And Baltic countries decided to give lethal aid already to Ukraine. Of course, internally, I don't know, was it in Latvia and Lithuania also, but in Estonia there was a loud voices. Why you are doing that? You are escalating relations with Russia. We will be under threat. We don't know what Russia will do. But there was the courage to decide that we, we will give this aid because we know war is starting, aggression is starting. And it started after one and a half months, exactly the same day when Estonia is celebrating Independence Day. Russia destroyed our party. What I would like to say that, that we have to look the patterns. What's happening? If Russia started with the exercise 2021 on the borders of Ukraine, what's going on right now in Taiwan Straits? What China is doing? Exercising. And if we analyze that information, we have to make decisions. Not just say that, mm, maybe not, uh, they said different words. And, and that's the real situation on, uh, in the world. What do you have to do? Like Edremina said, we have to educate our people. Absolutely true. Absolutely agree. We have to start from kindergarten up to the elderly house. I can bring one more example concerning the education and, and understanding. Our eastern part of Estonia is um, mostly crowded by the Russian-speaking people. Of course, they are living in Estonia, but they are on Russian infosphere. They are looking at Russian TV, listening to Russian radio, etc., etc. Some weeks after aggression started again, I visited, as a defense minister, that region. And what I said, and what they saw over there, there was a conflict inside the families. Parents said that Putin is a right man. He is going to Ukraine to fight for the right thing. And younger people said, no, he is an aggressor. That means that even through that media channels, Russia tried to destroy our unity in Estonia, destroy our understanding of democratic values. What does it mean? It, very important is the, what is the resilience of the society to stand against this kind of information. At the end, we closed these channels. And the government gave extra money for the new channels to, to look that region. Secondly, what I would like to say that that change the information between reliable partners, it's the very important. Why? Because we are living on global world. 
And we have to trust each other. And this trust is not coming uh, with the one day. We have to work for that, to find trustful, reliable partners. I can say in Central and, and Eastern Europe, we, we have no problem. I remember the times when I worked as a police officer, when our neighbor Finland doesn't trust our police officers and didn't give simple criminal police information to, to our colleagues. It took more than 10 years to prove that we are reliable partners. It's again one of the examples. With that message, uh, yes, oh, I, I would like to say that Kedriminas brought one example when, uh, when uh, there was a story about uh, foreign troops in Lithuania raped Lithuanian girl. It, exactly the same thing happened in Estonia. Exactly the same thing. They are using same tools, same forms, and we have to share this information that, to stand against that. Thank you, and I will finish at the moment with that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, uh, I'd like to move on to our next panelist. Um, the floor is yours, Jennifer. Many thanks. And let me begin by thanking the Prospect Foundation for the invitation to be here today. And also, uh, Xi it's a real privilege uh, to be on the panel with you, given your recognized leadership in mitigating uh, mis- and disinformation and the coalition of civil society organizations of which you form part. I, uh, I am the director of the Information Integrity Lab at the University of Ottawa. So we have a role in advancing the understanding and mitigation of mis- and disinformation. I did have uh, 35 years of experience uh, within the Canadian government uh, prior, but I feel free not to represent the views of Canada here. Uh, so I feel liberated in not uh, having to do that, although I will use some uh, Canadian uh, examples. One thing that has stayed with me from my experience, though, is I, I spent a good part of my career in government in understanding uh, global trends and threats. So I thought in my presentation I would just take a step back so that we understand kind of the bigger picture of, of what is really the threat of, of digital authoritarianism, what's at stake, uh, what are the responses that we have been uh, exercising uh, to counter it, and what are the gaps and challenges. So it's kind of the what, so what, and then the then what. Uh, so starting with, uh, with, with the what, I mean, by leveraging uh, digital uh, technologies, uh, democracies have, have modernized our, electro our electoral infrastructures and created more opportunities uh, for public participation. And it is this exactly what uh, digital authoritarianism has, uh, has, uh, has targeted. Uh, they targeted the our election infrastructure. Uh, they also uh, target our public debates uh, with mis- and disinformation with the intent of influencing outcomes. I think also we have to recognize we've been spending a lot of time discussing anecdotes of, of narratives, mis- and disinformation narratives. We also have to understand that there's also a bigger agenda, and that is that uh, digital authoritarian governments uh, like uh, Russia, like China, also export uh, surveillance uh, technologies to others. And in so doing, they are uh, gradually developing an alternative uh, global infrastructure um, that is based on uh, citizen surveillance that runs counter uh, to uh, a democratic approach. And so part of my remarks will also be taking stock of, of the, that bigger picture and what we need to do as, as democracies. In other words, we should not just be focused on our own national democratic uh, threats, but we should also be looking at ways in which we can collaborate in order to uh, counter the, the broader threat of digital authoritarianism. So uh, through um, disinformation campaigns, uh, digital authoritarians disrupt and polarize public debates. So what is their intent on doing that? Well, it's to skew 
uh, public discourse, generate misleading narratives, and in the short run, this obviously has a, a disruptive effect on our, on our elections. How do they do this? Through a variety of digital uh, tools, including botnets, uh, troll farms, state-sponsored uh, narratives. There's a variety of methodologies uh, that are used in order per to perpetuate uh, false narratives. But what happens over the medium and longer term? Over the medium longer term, it has a fact of creating electorates uh, which are disengaged, uh, which don't show up, which end up being distrustful, and that has a, um, a, a negative effect on our ability to not only conduct elections, but also to keep alive a, a lively uh, democratic uh, discourse. It also can narrow debate. Uh, by, by uh, responding to specific agendas that are at the interest of the digital authoritarian actors who target us. In terms of the Canadian context, um, Canada is targeted by disinformation uh, campaigns uh, by uh, 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 digital authoritarian actors who target our, our strengths as vulnerabilities. Canada's strength is that we have a very connected population uh, Eighty-five percent of Canadians are, are connected. Uh, we have, because of our geography, uh, that is one of the, the consequences. We also uh, have a high percentage of millennials and Gen Zs who rely exclusively on social media for their news. Sixty percent of millennials and eighty-five percent of Gen Zs. That's their source of, of news. Uh, so there have been comments earlier in this conference about. Uh, you know, the decline of traditional journalism and what that means in terms of the accuracy of, um, of, uh, of information. And uh, that also uh, creates a vulnerability. Canada is also a multicultural uh, country and our diasporas have been uh, targeted by mis and disinformation, particularly by China, which is something I'll come back to uh, later in my, in my presentation. And finally, um, we are both uh, members of important coalitions such as G7 and, uh, and NATO, uh, and those coalitions depend on a uh, you know, collaboration between North America and Europe, uh, which is also disrupted by disinformation, that's particularly on the part of, of, uh, of Russia. So in terms of, um, of our um, experience with disinformation, uh, most of the attacks against Canada are actually un unattributed. But we have a very good uh, cybersecurity infrastructure in Canada, and we know that uh, roughly 80% uh, comes from two actors, uh, Russia and China. So we have experience with both that we have been discussing uh, today, unfortunately. Um, and uh, a, th a distant third is, is, is Iran that we haven't been talking about in, in this session. Um, but I'm going to be uh, focusing uh, almost exclusively on Russia and, uh, and China. Uh, so the, the, both uh, Russia and China have uh, very different uh, information ecosystems. They are highly controlled. Uh, they control uh, ac access uh, to uh, the internet. Uh, they control debates within their uh, society and uh, the, to different, differing degrees. Uh, and they also have uh, very advanced surveillance uh, techniques. Uh, in terms of their, uh, their tactics and methods are a, a little bit different uh, in our view. Russia is more a distributed network uh, in terms of, of, of how they uh, employ their disinformation strategies. They make use of uh, proxies. Um, they have lower cost alternatives, which when they export those, uh, that toolkit um, to others, that's certainly an advantage uh, for those who don't want to invest in the highly sophisticated infrastructure that is the hallmark of, uh, of China. So turning to China, China has probably the most advanced and concerted uh, program of, of uh, disinformation. Uh, it's, it has a cohesive partnership that exists between a government, uh, state-controlled industry, uh, academia, uh, organizations uh, within uh, uh, China, and that uh, results in a, a multi-layered um, infrastructure that is highly uh, coordinated. So you have a distributed network from, from, uh, from Russia's perspective, um, more coordination from, from China, but their, their basic goals remain uh, the same. 
Um, in terms of the methodologies they use, um, from our observation, Russia is a little bit different insofar as uh, they tend to try to perpetuate uh, chaos um, or uh, disruption uh, for its own sake in order to disrupt uh, democracies. Uh, and uh, in our case, as being part of the uh, NATO alliance, they also try to drive uh, wedges uh, within uh, our alliances. They also try to, to, to um, uh, target wedges uh, within uh, democratic societies, um, making use of very sensitive issues, whether that be around diaspora issues or sensitive issues around uh, gender identity or LGBTQ, uh, any issues around which there is a lively uh, public uh, discourse and division, uh, they will seek uh, to draw uh, wedges. Uh, in China's cases, we, we, we've, uh, we've seen a more um, sophisticated approach in terms of objectives. It uh, uses mis and disinformation largely as uh, influence campaigns. In Canada, we've seen that uh, in, on issues around uh, Huawei. Uh, we've also uh, seen it in our own um, elections. And if I can just draw an example of that in our last elections, uh, there was a targeting uh, of, uh, of Canada's infrastructure and also uh, key candidates uh, by uh, China, which is the subject of a, uh, a commission uh, now uh, that's looking at what happened and what, could, what we could possibly do in the future to avoid that. The tactics we used were um, spamouflage, which is also uh, used in, in Taiwan's um, elections, uh, spam meaning everywhere, camouflage meaning deception. Uh, so as, as spamouflage was, was, was used uh, in order, um, both against uh, the leaders of our, of our parties and particular candidates. It actually wasn't uh, particularly effective because it wasn't carried by algorithms. Uh, so it wasn't as effective as some of the other techniques. What was effective was uh, micro-targeting. Uh, so in, in, uh, in this case, uh, the micro-targeting was directed twofold. One against um, the uh, Chinese diaspora uh, through WeChat, uh, Chinese uh, language WeChat, uh, which was not um, uh, monitored as closely as it should have been uh, by Canadian authorities who focus on more English language press. Uh, and so this was, this was one that was slow to come uh, to the fore. Uh, the other was a targeting of, of key politicians who had taken uh, anti-Chinese uh, positions. Uh, one of those um, is Michael Chong, who is a, now the, uh, um, the foreign affairs uh, critic of the, the Conservative Party, who had uh, led motions, uh, human rights motions against um, uh, China dealing with the, the Uyghur issue. Um, he was targeted uh, by campaign and disinformation, and that was brought to the fore. And as I mentioned, now there is a foreign co commission in Canada that's looking at these tactics in part to draw uh, lessons uh, for the, the future. In terms of how uh, we and other democracies respond to disinformation, there's really two classes of measures, uh, intervention and inoculation. And intervention uh, measures uh, can include a topic rebuttal, in, or, in other words, challenging, fact-checking the information. Uh, it, in, it can include uh, countering narratives, which can be effective in making sure there's an alternative a narrative that corrects the, the record. Um, or you can look at technique rebuttals. Uh, so um, the United States, for example, uses this quite frequently when it doesn't want to uh, uh, reiterate the, the actual misinformation narrative. You focus on contextualizing it by the perpetrator and uh, their, their, um, their methodologies. Given the speed at which uh, these narratives uh, can be propelled uh, through uh, social media and the algorithms, uh, speed becomes very important in terms of reaction. Um, Taiwan certainly had that uh, right in terms of the uh, multi-pronged approach that you took, the army really, of, um, of volunteers uh, that were, were um, uh, capitalized upon in order to uh, counter disinformation during your own elections. Um, just moving in terms of other um, things that we can, we can, we can do, I know uh, regulation um, has, been, has, been, has been minimized, Min regulation has not really proved effective, although uh, we find that the Digital Services Act 
um, within Europe, uh, an interesting model of, of what uh, might be possible, a, uh, an interesting baby step. Um, within the, the G7, uh, Canada actually houses the rapid response mechanism, uh, which, which has a mandate uh, to analyze um, strategically uh, mis and disinformation um, and, and counter it. Um, and there, there should be more collective efforts, I think, in terms of our work with technology companies, which so far have not really yielded uh, much fruit. And I don't think we should continue to wait for that to happen uh, without taking actions directly amongst uh, democracies. Inoculation measures have been, have been raised. Um, the more that we can pre-bunk, prepare our, our citizenry, and, uh, and also do public education around both digital literacy and education around mis- and disinformation uh, will in part uh, be ef effective moving forward in terms of enhancing the resiliency of, of, our, of our societies. But I think in general, when we're looking at responses uh, from democracies, uh, we need to look at a, a, a very sophisticated uh, toolkit. Uh, technology is most interesting. Um, my lab does a lot of work in terms of detecting uh, deep fakes, and it's a lot of fun uh, in terms of understanding you know, how they work, how they're countered. Um, but that's really uh, not a full um, uh, you know, solution. Uh, counter narratives are more important in terms of being able to strategically uh, counter uh, mis and disinformation. Increasing public resiliency, as I mentioned, has to go alongside. We invest a lot in critical thinking, not a lot in critical understanding, and our public needs to be better uh, prepared um, as we move forward because dis and misinformation is going to remain with us. Holding tech uh, companies accountable uh, should be part of that mix too. We also need to go broader. Democracies need to work together to try to develop codes and governance as a counter <clears throat> to what's happening in terms of um, digital authoritarians um, exporting their surveillance technology. If we don't act soon, we'll, we'll, it'll be too late in order to set the groundwork for a constructive digital governance. So I'll leave my comments there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, last one at least. Renfu, uh, Professor Wang, the floor is yours. Hi. Hello. Uh, my, name, uh, my name is uh, Renfu Wang. But uh, uh, maybe uh, four years ago, I worked in the National Security Con uh, Council. So I, in a hacker domain, I, uh, I have a nickname. It's a 5566. Five, okay. Not a zero zero seven. Okay, it's my nickname. So uh, because I uh, work in the National Security Council, we will uh, look into and uh, to analyze the hacker behavior. Uh, maybe the hacker is uh, come from China. You know, China hacker is very uh, famous. Maybe you can call them uh, APT forty one, APT three. Okay, they uh, attack uh, uh, the democracy country in the world. So uh, today I will uh, discuss a uh, critical and uh, evolving uh, theater, not Taiwan face. Okay, uh, the cognitive warfare uh, waged by China uh, cyber army. You know, uh, China cyber army is very famous in the uh, globalize. They, they do a lot of uh, uh, use the AI to make a lot of uh, uh, fake news or, 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 or do uh, a lot of uh, cyber attacks. Uh, so um, Taiwan was uh, advanced, because uh, Taiwan have a uh, advanced uh, uh, IT infrastructure, is uh, highly vulnerable to uh, cyber attacks. However, Taiwan's uh, situation is unique due to the persistent uh, and the target effort by China. That, uh, China uh, disrupt our society, government, and the way of life. Okay, so uh, Taiwan have a long uh, been a target of cyber attack. You can find the uh, new any new pattern, a hacker uh, attack pattern in uh, Taiwan. Uh, for example, the uh, malicious, the uh, the uh, ransomware uh, malicious in Taiwan. Okay, for example, the global 
impose R3. They use the uh, global impose, uh, impose R3, this uh, uh, ransomware, to attack a lot of country. Okay, so uh, these uh, attacks are often uh, accompanied, uh, accompanied by the disinformation campaign designed to uh, confuse and um, manipulate public opinion in Taiwan. For instance, about three years ago, when Taiwan was prepared to open our market to United States, it's a, a, a pork, pork import. Uh, China launched a coordinated cognitive welfare campaign. They, they create and spread, spread fake news and uh, 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 a lot of fake accounts on a, a social media platform like uh, Facebook or Nine, they uh, to sort to uh, undermine Taiwan's relationship with the uh, United States, and uh, they saw this code within our society. In our uh, analysis of group behavior, uh, the face, fake Facebook account operate by China cyber force. They uh, revered, revered uh, a troubling trend. For example, in uh, uh, 2016 and uh, uh, 17, uh, this operation were likely conducted by real people. Real people, you know, uh, real people is a hacker in China. But now, um, since uh, 2018, they make a lot of uh, bots, you know, but use the AI, they can uh, automatic to, uh, to uh, make the uh, disinformation or fake news. Uh, significantly is uh, he uh, expanding the scale of this operation. Automated operations are primarily uh, focused on a nationwide political issue. Because the China they will to influence Taiwan's uh, political issue, uh, so they um, uh, they influence a broad uh, strong uh, spectrum of public uh, disclosure. This the target for the mass dis uh, the uh, dissemination include a wide uh, variety of group such as the anti-Taiwan independence group. And even uh, non-public, uh, public, uh, political entity like the lifestyle or entertainment group. Okay, so uh, this target, ta target show the uh, in extensive reach and uh, 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 type of ability of China a uh, competitive welfare, welfare effort. Uh, more recently, China uh, cyber force has have also begun use the TikTok. TikTok, you know, have everybody have maybe a lot of people they like to uh, to watch the TikTok. They use the TikTok to fund and uh, support their cognitive uh, welfare activity in Taiwan. They uh, involve uh, laundry money. You know, laundry money. Uh, TikTok have a TikTok coin. It's a very big laundry money. Okay, so they laundry the the low the low laundry money to sell TikTok coins, uh, which are uh, then uh, they uh, to the local co cooperator in Taiwan is a TikToker like a YouTuber. Okay, um, uh, this the cooperator often uh, uh, in in influence or impact uh, social media um, and uh, uh, to our people uh, uh, and uh, create uh, disinformation or fail uh, information in the TikTok. Uh, for example, in the June uh, 2023, uh, maybe uh, one year ago, Taiwanese, have, uh, uh, Taiwanese couple was uh, accused of operating an illegal cost-trade exchange uh, business 
strong and this uh, uh, tea tuck store and they laid long dream over uh, 117 70 million NTD dollars is a huge money in here such this instant issue it is uh, um, and uh, the uh, cover to the method to use the, to support the cognitive welfare to operate uh, to operate in some uh, this information in Taiwan the, and the to uh, influence or impact the opinion in Taiwan uh, maybe about the uh, 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 political issue okay so China's uh, company con cognitive welfare uh, operative uh, uh, TikTok uh, monitoring system is uh, uh, in uh, several ways. Uh, they promote the fake news uh, as the promotion, uh, promotional uh, contents or pay the partnership uh, generating on and uh, based on the traffic and click. And they have a donate system. You know, donate. You can donate the money in the TikTok. Donation made du uh, during uh, life strain and used for money laundering. They, they use the TikTok coin, pay the TikTok coin to the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 some, uh, some people, they make this information. Uh, TikTok, uh, uh, TikTok uh, uh, make marketplace is another uh, a main a menu uh, so which uh, creator uh, earn income by engaging in the uh, cognitive welfare. This activity uh, are often intended intended and uh, to the Facebook online where they can reach and and uh, even a uh, broader audience. So in Taiwan, we have this, uh, to, in the response to this field, Taiwan has strengthened this, uh, we have to make a legal framework to combat uh, this information and uh, uh, fraud, fraud. And for example, in the uh, July uh, 2024 uh, this year, Taiwan passed the uh, four anti fraud law, including the fraud, uh, fraud uh, criminal or a crime uh, prevention act, and uh, the uh, uh, telecommunication security and the surveillance act. Because this uh, act and to to uh, relative uh, virtual uh, asset service to prevent uh, money uh, laundering, laundering with the criminal uh, penalty for the unregistered uh, uh, service provider. Uh, in, uh, in the uh, parliamentary strict re 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 uh, regula regulation on the third party payment service to prevent uh, their use in the money uh, laundering. So in the uh, uh, increasing the uh, penalty for the money laundering enhance the cooperate or uh, the responsibility trends the uh, a company, a company and uh, expand the scope of the criminal uh, process uh, confusion. So China cognitive welfare against Taiwan is very clear and the and the pre prevent prevent danger uh, by understanding their method and uh, take a uh, proactive measure. Taiwan can per, uh, uh, protect uh, 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 our security and uh, to ensure the safety uh, of our people. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Professor Wang. Thank you, Renfu, for the uh, presentation. So we've finished five uh, excellent statements, uh, presentations. We've heard from our panelists various tactics, strategies by these manipulators, by these 
uh, digital bullying persons, uh, peoples, or organizations. Uh, and thank you for our final panelists to connect our topic to other topics like money laundering and fraud, which uh, Taiwan government is trying to combat very much recent recently. I would like to highlight various impact uh, mentioned by our panelists uh, from these disinformation campaigns. Uh, it costs real human life. It causes impact uh, and damages to our economic system. It causes public trust. It, it creates div division or uh, exacerbates division amongst our society. In, in, in uh, division lies amongst generations, ethnicities, and uh, political party and issue supporters. It, it drives wedges in, in our international allies and uh, it creates problem in our families as well. Uh, families uh, uh, argue over this. And, mo and most importantly, it creates doubt uh, in ourselves towards our value and our way of life. Um, and all of our panelists uh, talked about the importance of international partnerships and collaboration in, in terms of dealing with the challenges in, in a global scale. And finally, the importance of evidence-based work, uh, try to gain public trust uh, uh, and uh, moving forward. So um, I would like to, I hope you've been thinking about your questions. I would like to open up to the floor and uh, uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions. Our staff will give you a microphone and I already see uh, uh, Professor Leo right there. So you'll be the first, please. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. So my name is Wumi Liu. I am Associate Professor of the Taiwan uh, International, uh, excuse me, National uh, Taiwan Normal University. And I am I just retired from the MJIB. Uh, that means uh, Minister Justice Investigation Bureau's is very important role enforcement in Taiwan. Uh, I, my question is, uh, when uh, we know that this information spread have to through the uh, local collaborator, that means uh, not, that means uh, someone to spread a lot of this information. When I, um, um, uh, uh, when I am a, a special agency in uh, MJIB, we have to spend a lot of energy to use the, according the law to uh, punishment, uh, to punish the uh, uh, not, I mean the not, the, the spread the uh, information to someone. So uh, I want to ask uh, Mr. Unas, uh, 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 how do you do uh, to deal with the not in Israel, especially you under so uh, uh, precious uh, uh, from uh, you are outside? Uh, you, uh, how do you do that? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. But can, can you repeat? How do you, how how do you deal with the node that spreads this information in okay, Israel? Okay, the nodes. Well, if you handle only the nodes, or you're looking for the nodes, uh, you lost the game before it started. Uh, our <clears throat> first move is to understand who's behind, where the, the head of the snake, or where the initiation. It's not easy. It sometimes takes months. By the way, my uh, 556 colleague here with the it's five five six six <laughs> six oh excuse me so uh, we'll uh, reaffirm that there's no really a, an attribution problem in cyber everybody speaks about it but the truth is that any decent agency uh, in the country is you pull the thread you know who is behind it it sometimes takes a lot of time but in all the times almost all of the times it's uh, uh, not relevant for uh, uh, bringing to justice or to, to get the law, legislation, the criminal uh, uh, processes all around the world are way behind it. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned that uh, dealing with the nodes is uh, not futile but less effective in overall. Now, many times the, these nodes are fooled. They are not even aware and we have that now in Israel in large volumes. Iranians are, are doing a lot of, trying to do a lot of damage, not by just uh, uh, shooting missiles that we intercept, but also um, even much more through uh, uh, bullying, digital bullying. And we don't uh, arrest any of these. Uh, we bring them to investigation. 
uh, and we, we uh, uh, warn them, these people, and most of the time they are shocked that they are used by the enemy for their purposes. They thought it's, it's uh, legitimate, it's, it's part of their uh, way of thinking or, or something like that. Once you show them that they are only pawns, stupid pawns, on the board, they usually, by their own uh, means, uh, walk, walk aside, uh, relax, apologize even, publicly. Uh, but uh, uh, having said that, if you find, and if we find, we find we just arrested a spy working for the Iranians. He got money. That's crossing the line. That's a node that should be stay in prison. But most of the nodes, if you just go and pick the nodes, you lost the game. You need to, to go upper, upstream and start there. And cutting the head of the snake usually is helpful. Thank you, Igor. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to add to that question? Okay. All right. Yes, please, sir. Can we have microphone in front? Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Yu Jinglin. I'm the Deputy Minister of Digital Affairs in Taiwan. And my question is, who should take the lead in fighting misinformation and disinformation? Is that the government? or the uh, social media platforms like Facebook and Google or some NGO. Because we know that in a democracy, people do not like the uh, co government to take control of the media. Thank you. Yes, generally frowned upon. Uh, uh, Gidrimus, would you like to? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I kind of briefly refer to that, that you know, first of all, the, these platforms need to be regulated. now. I think what has been created with social media, although despite all the fanfare when they all kind of came to, 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 to start working, it was, you know, the Section 230 in California sort of, it sort of gives them freedom of, they're not responsible for that. It's only the, what, the user who posts, you know, and, and then you're not responsible. You can do whatever you want there, especially. I think the realization now is that this is not working. I think it's universal. Now, there's, there'll be lobbyists who will pay millions and millions to make sure that the regulation does not come through. But this is, you know, I think it's every government needs, I mean, in Taiwan, I met, in, in Europe, we have a European Union regulation. There's some, some conformity with the regulation and the European Union can actually can enforce that versus NATO, which can actually raise the issue. But NATO, the way NATO works is uh, uh, it's a consensus-based organization, the only thing that you must do as a country is to pay the, your bills for budget. But other things, you kind of, you, you sign up, you, you sign up by consensus, but really, if you don't meet your 2% requirement on defense, well, nobody's going to punish you explicitly. Um, now, I think with the, with the EU, it does help, but I think inside the, the country, I think it's uh, really, I mean, there's, there's many, many debates. I think social media cannot be allowed to stay unpunished. It, it cannot be that way that the social media shareholders who are not elected, who are Mark Zuckerberg, maybe he's a great guy, but I, I don't know him, but he determines, he can determine the, the, the res election results, he can determine the swings in various trends that can be eventually harmful for the society. So. You know, you have to put where, you know, it has to be a lot more stricter, you know, sort of regulation. So I think it's, you know, it, it, well, nowadays, what is media? One person could be a media if you have, your, you have a way to, to sort of get into the online services. So it could be, so Facebook could be other, other, other platforms. So it's a, it's a complex question, but I think it's about government really taking charge and making sure that, you know, the interests of the people and of the society are... Are, 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 are taken care of. Thank you. Igor, would you like to add? And we could go down. So very shortly, it must be a, a PPP, a public-private partnership. No single element of those you mentioned can, can win that alone. Not the government, the reasons you mentioned and others, and uh, not the, uh, let's say, the motivation of the social media not to speak about TikTok, that uh, no motivation there probably. Uh, so there must be a, a more a, a, a co-orchestrated movement. Who needs to lead it? Yes, the governments. That's why, why we have governments, that we, we invented governance. Somebody needs to take this train forward. 
but yes, you need all the other parts of the train, not just the engine. And that's meaning the, the working together, convincing, and also uh, pressing if, if needed, because not all the motivations uh, aligned, and you need to, to get them into the, the right rails, so to speak. Yes, it's a very sensitive question. Where is sending free words, free media, where we can control? <clears throat> I am coming back to the, uh, to the how strengthen is society, what are the society's values and, and all that. But um, of course, everything has changed right now. And, uh, and who is taking responsibility to control, who is not taking? We, we have one case uh, when one person went against uh, one media platform, uh, there was a comment, very nasty comment about the person. And uh, at first the Estonian court and uh, at the end of the European court said that uh, for this comment is responsible media platform, not the person who wrote that. It's uh, one of the examples. Uh, Yes, who is responsible to control? I believe that the previous answer is the correct and, and uh, to say directly that the responsibility is for the government or the, or the platforms, um, we are global, we are global. And, and all these global values are also so important, but we know all the regulations and following the regulations is only for the good guys. Bad guys are doing what they want. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer? I am also a supporter of uh, public private public Chicago. I think I dropped it at one point. <laughs> I'm also a fan of the uh, the, the private uh, public uh, partnership uh, model. Uh, but I do think uh, that it needs to be coordinated and there needs to be an understanding within what is the value added that uh, non-governmental actors bring and what is the value added that governments uh, bring. I, I am personally fascinated by Taiwan's experience in leveraging a huge network of uh, volunteers uh, in civil society organizations uh, to detect and repel disinformation. It's not something I think that is highly replicable, at least in, in, in Canada. I think uh, within uh, Taiwan, you also have uh, not only a healthy civil society movement, but one that is highly motivated, uh, that sees uh, the existential threat uh, to its democracy uh, in a way that uh, most Canadians uh, don't. And so that's definitely a strength of the Taiwan a system, but I think it's fairly unique uh, to, to, to Taiwan. I think what governments can bring is, uh, is coordination and also uh, a, str a strategic analysis that's important in developing counter-narratives. Uh, because it's one thing to bring disinformation down, to make it disappear, to repel it, uh, but uh, it's most effective if you can replace that with, uh, with a counter-narrative. And really, counter-narratives uh, are you know, really the projection of the identity of the state. And so that, in my view, is where governments uh, can really play a role on that uh, strategic side. Uh, also in regulation to the extent that uh, it is provided for, and certainly in terms of international partnerships. Uh, I think democracies can, can do more in uh, sharing information, sharing information about where narratives have been effective, what kinds of narratives have been effective, how, uh, counter, what countermeasures have been uh, employed. And uh, we, we can do that even uh, without there being an international organization. We can do that uh, by democracies coming together. Uh, we shouldn't be alone and we shouldn't regard our, our uh, efforts as being nation state focused uh, because I think there's uh, quite a bit that we can do uh, that's, uh, that's transnational. Okay, I echo uh, the PPP uh, is uh, because uh, our association, hacker association or university, all need a lot of money, come from the digital department. Okay, to promote and uh, support our our research, 
Okay, we we can uh, the hacker can to trace or to analyze and uh, to get the bot, because the uh, China they use the bot to influence the or make the disinformation. So democracy is a protect people, not AI bot. But the China or Russia they use they make a lot of AI bot. They they maybe one minute or uh, one second, they make a lot of this information very shortly. And in the Facebook or line, just say, oh, you, you say anything to bullshit and, uh, and to publish a lot of uh, this information and to influence the uh, political uh, opposition or uh, people's choice. Okay, so if we, we can get uh, uh, the if the hacker, the white hacker, white hacker, can help our government. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, okay, there's a, oh, and there's one, sorry, let's collect three questions, please, one, and then two, and then there. Yes. Okay, uh, my name is Hong Da Chen from TABF, uh, Taiwan Academy of Banking and Finance. Uh, I have a question for the, uh, do uh, uh, because uh, I uh, because you are a military and a financial background. Um, how did you think about the uh, weaponization of uh, finance or uh, cyber attacks on the financial industry uh, uh, during the uh, Great Zone conflict or using the uh, financial warfare? Uh, as a precursor uh, before the invasion. Uh, thank you. Okay, that sounds like a question for the first panel, but please respond. And then uh, second question, please. Hello, uh, my name is Masahiro Matsumura, Taiwan fellow from Japan. Uh, some of your uh, panelists emphasize that the importance of uh, international partnership. I think it's a good as a slogan, but in practice, I think it's very difficult to achieve because uh, in a, within a one country, the law enforcement, intelligence, and the military has a warm claim for the jurisdiction. And then uh, they sometimes do not agree with who will be responsible for what. For example, in the United States, we heard that there is an unsmooth and occasionally hostile relationship between the National Security Agency and the cyber, US Cyber Command. And then, so even within the country, it's, the, it's, it's not tough to coordinate how you can achieve the international partnership and cooperation. And uh, maybe in Israel, because it's a site is very small, and then the relationship between uh, different segments of the actors are very intimate and smooth, maybe they may have a different. So please share uh, some of the successful and then unsuccessful experience, and then give us uh, your prospect how we can achieve genuine, working, effective international partnership. Thank you. Thank you. And a third, please. Yes. <clears throat> um, I go by G-Man. I work at INDSR. That's a think tank here in Taiwan. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, hackers and government uh, agencies that employ hackers do is look at the seams of a society. They look for areas where there's weakness. And one of the areas I think is a weak, a weak area is the commercial world. And <clears throat> one of the problems is, is that a lot of you have been talking about what the government is doing about the attacks on government. But can you talk about what you're doing in terms of protecting commercial arenas such as uh, if you get, let's say, information that a financial institution is going to be attacked, what procedures do you do to protect them? Because, as I understand, <clears throat> most of you have been talking about protecting the government, but what do you do about protecting um, companies? Thank you. Okay, thank you for your questions. Would you like to start? I guess I'll start with uh, this financial warfare question. I think. And I think we have to take a step back and think about the war. Actually, we can use example of Ukraine war or, or any other 
hot conflict at, at the moment, it's not just kinetic. It's really everything. And in, like, I can give you an example from, from NATO. When we used to, what the threat is, what the security issues are, it used to be all military, there's army, navy, maritime, like the, no, so that includes space force, that includes cyberspace. It sort of it continues to expand. Now you include economic tools, technological tools. It's broadening to everything in the society, really. So really the financial tools, the, the kind of financial instruments of power, if you will, are equally important. And what the EU has done it really on versus uh, versus Russia, really by the you know the, regarding the SWIFT payments uh, with the SWIFT system, I think that's. I would say it was way too late. <laughs> it should have been done much earlier. But that's the, the speed of that where our institutions operate nowadays in democracies. Again, this is a democratic issue. Um, it, it could have been done much, much faster. But that's a way to to make sure that the the aggressor then is able. You know, it affects the aggressor and is able to change its course. This has not really worked yet to the extent that we want it to, to, to work. But it, it's, it's, you know, I think if you look in the longer run, I think is exactly the, it should be definitely one of the tools to use as the military response, the kind of cyber defense, cyber offense even. Uh, anything that, it, financial tools are absolutely important. And because we're so interconnected, and I think, you know, even thinking about the, we, we discussed at panel one, I think, that, uh, and yesterday at INDSR, we they talked a lot about it. So what does it mean kinetic action by China? Well, is that a deterrent if you're able to turn it off, turn off the, the SWIFT system? I'm not sure. Again, we need to play, play a lot of war games there to, to really understand how it would work. But again, this, if it's uh, something that we can leverage, we should be able to use that. Thank you. Well, uh, regarding the international uh, cooperation, well, I, one of the, the biggest uh, silver lining or, or optimistic messages we can go out from here today is exactly that. It's, it's everything but a slogan. Uh, in fact, as we speak, there's uh, uh, just the Israeli case. We have more than 90-something uh, countries operationally working daily, uh, cert to cert, uh, uh, cyber... Uh, uh, command and control centers with others, including uh, when I was uh, showing it on, on maps when I was in office, the map was uh, missing some of the countries we cannot show because we don't have diplomatic relations, but we have very strong cyber relations with them. Even here in the region, I will not elaborate, of course. And that's because the nature of this threat is international, it's global. When Iran is attacking Israel on an hourly basis, they don't go directly. This is the, the best practice of today's. Everyone goes through other countries and trying to hide. So when Iran attacks, they go through uh, Lithuania and then Sweden and then India and then Israel. Once we're aligned, and that goes for cybercrime groups as well that attack India or Lithuania, they go through Israel. So once we're aligned, and yes, I inaugurated the Global Cyber Cabinet back in 2019. There were 20 countries, including US and India and UK and, uh, and Japan and others. Now it's more than 33 countries. The problem is it's only the cyber agencies. They are not law enforcement. Interpol is a great international, not a slogan, international cooperation, law enforcement, but they don't really understand cyber. And I, I tell them in the face, it's not something that I hide from them. Now, when these two parallel international corporations between cyber agencies, and I hope, I wish, I work that Taiwan will be part of it, and the Interpol will collide, then we'll see a drop in ransomware and maybe the prices will get a little lower. Thank you. Excuse me? Sorry? You talk about law enforcement and cyber agencies, but I'm, you got to also include the military s cyber command. Militaries has their international cooperation level as well, but, and that's uh, uh, insinuating to the last question I'll, I'll give my colleagues to answer. Uh, 
no, we don't talk about government defending government. That's boring. That's the, the, the government, at least those I know, like-minded countries to Israel, we, we work in defending the, the, the critical infrastructure, the, the private sectors, and uh, that's the main goal. The, the, the government is, by the way, the, most, the least targeted in many places, and the military knows how to defend themselves usually. So the government needs to take care of everybody else. I just <clears throat> want to add that um, the first step of cooperation is starting between human beings, person to person, and then institutions, and then the third round, etc., etc. If I trust Artis, I will talk to him secret information. <laughs> I trust Artis. Thank you, Jennifer. I think in terms of international collaboration, perhaps coordinated international collaboration is uh, aspirational and maybe a, a step too far. Uh, but I think there's a lot that democracies can do in terms of transparency and sharing information. For example, about uh, databases. You know, it can take a, a long time for, for labs to, to scrape uh, into uh, you know, make sure that the data they use is, is, is clean and it's, um, it's verifiable. And so sharing information on, on databases of both uh, kind of that evidence-based uh, information, uh, but also about narratives. So what narratives, uh, disinformation narratives are out there? How do you keyword them? So these are, these are issues in which I think that there could be more um, collaboration, again, in a, in a trusted um, environment. But looking for coordinated action is probably a step too far. We've seen uh, a number of years now being invested into trying to work in small groups with technology companies to try to advance collaboration. That has not uh, yielded fruit, although that, that work uh, should, should continue. In terms of the application to uh, the, uh, the, the private sector, um, the, the methodology that we use in, in our still young lab is actually a methodology that's adapted from looking at um, a narrative risk in a private uh, sector situation. So that what we look for is, uh, you know, what is the, the propensity of a, of a narrative? How is that being, with the speed at which it is accelerating through the system? So, like, for example, if um, a narrative is, is, is not accelerating, um, then it's 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 kind of noise. It's it's something that 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 we uh, won't necessarily look at if it's accelerating fast, uh, but there is no harm associated with it. Well, you know, then then that might be also something uh, that we don't um, uh, concern ourselves with. Which we're, what we do concern ourselves with, whether it be private sector or in a in a public environment, is when you have an accelerating uh, narrative and it's harmful either in terms of its influence or it's not, especially in terms of its influence on behavior. And so, so that can be applicable to, to, to either situation. In fact, one of the examples that we run in our training courses is about is, is supply chain examples um, because uh, uh, increasingly companies do not have control over their own supply chains. There's some disinformation narratives that might hit a part of their chain that they're not familiar with. For example, allegations about child labor, um, and if those start accelerating, the, the reputational risk on a, on a business can be, can be, um, can be acute. Um, so certainly, you're quite correct in, in emphasizing the importance of us to be looking at also vulnerabilities in our economy and in our private sectors as well. Thank you very much. Professor Wang, you have the final words of this okay, panel. I, I think every, everybody, everyone is, uh, is hungry. So, so if we have any question, you can find me. Okay, okay, it's the final. Thank you. So thank you for the reminder. Please reach out to our panelists. Um, and once, once again, a warm round of applause for our panels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Many thanks to co-director Yo and all our panelists for a wonderful discussion session. And please return to your seat in the audience.